um, much of the re uh, rehabilitation process after a brain injury is really focused on that physical component, um, how someone moves and you know how they function. But a lot of times we see that years down the line, um, many people living with brain injury find themselves isolated, maybe unmotivated, maybe more sedentary over time, um, potentially putting them at risk for additional chronic diseases, uh, potential falls and other injuries, mental health challenges, and obesity. And I think that comes a lot from not knowing what to do to better reach goals, loss of functionality, and particularly with fitness, it can be really intimidating to know even where to start. So, um, you know, I, I, I think fitness is one of those things where it's an individual kind of journey, whether or not what one thing fits for you. Um, so this is one of those really great, um, you know, resources and something that I think we can learn from in terms of and how we can use fitness to uh, to help our function. So I have with me to, uh, here today, Jenna Marie Rosenthal, and um, she is a speech language pathologist and certified brain injury specialist or CBIS with over 10 years of experience in acute care and acute rehabilitation, treating clients with cognitive communication needs um, in the community and, and in the hospital settings. She is a CrossFit level two trainer and a certified adaptive and inclusive trainer and coaches classes and one-on-one -on -one sessions at Invictus Boston. Jenna has a master's degree in communication science is sciences and disorders and a certificate in adult teaching and learning from the MGH Institute of Health Professions. And she's also an, an adjunct professor in graduate uh, speech language pathology programs um, at the uh, same institute and in, at Northwestern, Northeastern University, I apologize. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over and just so excited to have you here today, Jenna, and to talk about your experience and knowledge related to adaptive fitness um, and um, brain injury. Take it away. Cool. All right, thanks so much for having me. Can you see everything? I'm hoping everything is okay with the slides. I have them up. I was. Uh, uh, telling Lauren and uh, it's been a long time since I've done a presentation where I don't have people uh, right in front of me so uh, I will do my best to kind of keep you guys live and interactive and interested without being able to kind of ask you questions but we're gonna save a pretty good amount of time at the end for questions so if you have any um, please jot those down um, and we'll get to it um, so uh, here we are. My name is Jenna Muri Rosenthal. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something I like to recall uh, fitness for functional neuro recovery. So we're going to talk about adaptive fitness and how that applies to the brain injury population, but, but also um, how fitness can change the brain uh, and how we have opportunities to sort of enhance rehab and recovery efforts in the gym with some uh, blended therapeutic approaches. Okay, so uh, Lauren did such a good job intro introducing me here that uh, I don't even need all these slides. I'm gonna click this all through, um, but you know, just to kind of reiterate my bio. So I'm a speech pathologist and a brain injury specialist. Um, I've actually been at this for about 13 years now. I spent the first half of my uh, speech career working at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in the brain injury unit, um, became a brain injury specialist, also specialized in uh, agitated behaviors and working with that population um, and sort of safety strategies around that. Uh, and about halfway through this career, I left Spalding and kind of moved on to Mass General where I do a little more uh, acute brain injury work so uh, and stroke as well. Um, so I'm primarily based in the neurology unit and the neuro ICU. Um, I'm also a professor um, at the MGH Institute of Health Professions, where I teach the uh, budding speech pathologist, the second year students, how to uh, work with brain injury. Um, and I'm the founder of this program called Fit to Function and kind of embedded in all of that. Um, speech therapist, I'm also a CrossFit level two trainer and an adaptive and inclusive trainer. And we're gonna talk sort of a little bit about what some of those things are. 
Um, so a couple disclosures I just always kind of have to put out there. So uh, while I'm not trying to sell you anything, you are going to hear a lot um, about things sort of through the eyes of my program, which is called Fit to Function. Uh, nothing in this, you know, this presentation is entirely independent of my work at Mass General Hospital, uh, as well as my association with the MG MGH Institute of Health Professions. So uh, nothing here represents either of those organizations. You're just going to hear about things coming from uh, my, my practice, the Fit to Function side. Okay, so if you sort of read the um, the bio on this course, which I'm sure you did, and that's why you're all here, um, we're going to talk quite a bit about the benefits of exercise and neuroplasticity and how functional fitness can enhance both cognitive communication and physical recovery of survivors of brain injury. So sort of outline for the day, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about speech pathology, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with tell you a bit about what CrossFit is um, and how that's tied into what Fit to Function is and how it came to be. We'll dig a little bit into disability awareness and then I'm gonna jump back to functional fitness, which is, um, well, I won't give it away. We'll talk more about it um, and what that means and on, built on top of that, what exactly is adaptive training. Uh, and then we'll get into how at Fit to Function, we blend fitness and cognitive communication rehabilitation in the gym setting. Uh, we'll go over a few case studies and we'll get into a little bit of science at the end. So I'm sure a lot of you here are familiar with speech pathology, but I always kind of like to, to give a little rundown just in case. Um, you know, the needs of any survivor of a brain injury can vary really greatly, right? We know that no two brain injuries are the same. And thus the profile of strengths and limitations can be very different. So, you know, for some individuals, they're going to have a range of cognitive needs. Some may have cognitive needs and no language. Some may have language needs and no cognitive needs. You may have individuals who have motor speech challenges being understood when they speak, but no language or cognition underneath it. We have things like apraxia and dysarthria. We know that some individuals um, surviving, who have survived brain injury have difficulty um, swallowing. And so, you know, speech therapists really do a whole lot of things. And when I go into their room, you know, uh, any speech therapist on this call will know that when you say, oh, I'm with speech and people go, I talk fine. Um, and it's sort of a thing that's uh, not known. We're not as well understood for all the things we can do. So my new line has been, I say, we do eating, drinking, talking and thinking. Um, and then sort of dig into what individuals may need for that and how those can differ. So, and for a lot of folks, right, the perception, like I just said, is that we really just work on language. We really just focus on talking. And, you know, for a lot of folks, we really underestimate how very challenging that is. And then when you start to talk about cognition, right, because in addition to speech and language, speech therapists are working on attention and memory and problem solving and reasoning planning, organization, things like safety and insight and visual spatial skills and all of that, folks don't, it's hard for a lot of people to make the leap as to like why does speech even do cognition. So I really like to give this sort of um, at a very base simple level, what do we have to do when we want to communicate, right? And in order to just ha have a chat with someone, we have to pay attention, right? There's the attention aspect to the things we want to say while paying attention to the person who is talking to us. We need to be able to filter out any competing background noise and really, you know, focus in on what it is that we're, we're thinking about. We have to remember what someone said to us. Um, and while you're doing that, you sort of have to hold on to that content in your working memory while you're reacting to that information and planning a response, right? So now we're layering in a lot of cognitive function. Um, in the midst of a conversation, you're also maybe reasoning through a potential problem that someone is, you know, kind of presenting to you, or perhaps you're like, oh no, this isn't going to go well. I have to figure out how we can smooth this over. Um, and in that time, you're also generating your response, remembering it, 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 what it is that you want to say, and then communicating it all while paying attention to it, filtering out that background noise, remembering what we've just said, and so on and forth, so forth. And it's a big cycle, right? So you know, communication is really complicated. We know that. Um, and the layered cognition is all a part of the picture. You know, I sometimes tell people that language is thought expressed. Um, and so we'll get in a little bit more into language and cognition and how that um, can be found in the gym and, and treated in the gym. So now I'm going to jump to CrossFit, right? Um, if I uh, had eyes on you all, I'd ask how many of you know what that is, but I'm going to just give you a little quick rundown, right? So, so what is CrossFit? And this 
comes directly from CrossFit, from the HQ, the headquarters website. So I'm not really trying to sell you anything or tell you anything that I made up, but CrossFit is defined as a lifestyle characterized by safe, effective exercise and sound nutrition. So it can be used to accomplish any goal. I want you to keep that in mind. Um, from improved health to weight loss to better performance. Um, and it works for everyone people who are just starting out and people who have trained for years. And that last little bit that it's for everyone is a lot of what we're gonna dig into today. So CrossFit's methodology is constantly varied functional fitness at high intensity. So essentially the fitness is different every day. Um, it can also be specifically targeted towards a certain goal. And by varying the conditions or what we call the stimulus in the gym, we have the ability to create greater adaptations. What do I mean by that? So say you are gardening, for example, um, really functional tasks that you might do on a day-to-day -day basis that we know is quite tiring. Um, and let's say you're out there and you're heaving around bags of mulch, right? When you pick up that first 30, 40, 50 pound bag of mulch, like it's heavy, but you do okay. Now, the longer the day goes on and by the time you get to the 12th or 13th or 14th bag of mulch, depends how big your garden is, right? Um, it feels harder and it feels heavier and maybe we've lost a little bit of our core stability and we're not moving things as well. Now, if in training we vary the stimuli or the conditions under which you do certain things, you have a better chance of being prepared for both scenarios, right? That first lift is a one-time heavy pickup of something, some a heavy object, and then those multiple lifts across time when you're tired is a different target. So this is what we mean by uh, constantly varied um, and kind of creating these greater adaptations so we're making you better prepared to do more things um, across contexts. So let's be honest, right? CrossFit has a bad reputation um, and everybody knows this and folks, uh, the very first podcast I did, someone said, now CrossFit, that's bad for you, right? And CrossFit, that's a cult, right? Um, and so I just kind of, I show this slide to be like, you know, most people who are looking at CrossFit from the outside without any real good information about it, view it as this crazy and intense, what are those people doing, right? We got people upside down, walking on their hands and swinging from rings and flipping tires and all kinds of funny things. But, you know, the truth is that any fitness routine is defined by the movements that it chooses to prioritize. And CrossFit prioritizes functional movements. So we're gonna talk about that as we go. Um, but like I said before, so we're defining CrossFit um, by functional movements by its three elements, which are constantly varied, the movements are functional, and they're executed at a high intensity. So don't get sucked into the trap of like, oh, it's just these elite athletes hanging, hanging from rings and walking on their hands. Because really, in reality, CrossFit looks a lot more like this. It is sort of your everyday gym goer. People who have shared goals come into the gym and you can be of all, from all walks of life, different ages, different abilities, and we're all sort of working towards the same goal. And we talk in CrossFit about something that I'll get into, get into in a bit called general physical preparedness. And uh, in CrossFit, we talk about that as being preparing you for the unknown and the unknowable. So we're trying to get your body ready to do a whole lot of things. Um, and the benefits are embedded within this varied nature of the workouts and the variations in load and intensity and duration and some of those things that I was talking about before. So kind of keep this picture in your head. This is more of your everyday class in a CrossFit setting. And in our setting, it really looks like this. And, you know, between that last slide and this slide, I, I see no difference except for a wider range of modifications, um, but creating the same adaptations, right? So we have um, people who are working out seated or in a wheelchair, people who only have one arm, people who need that they can use in fitness, folks who need a little bit more support um, to sort of hold on to something to get into a squat, um, and people who just need somebody kind of standing by maybe for steadying assistance to make sure that they can do some of the things that we want them to do. So even more so, just because I really like videos, um, I want you to just take a look at what it really looks like. And this is um, a, couple, a handful of my clients sort of mashed together. And a lot of the movements you see here are things that any athlete in any gym um, can do and does do sort of on, on a regular basis in a CrossFit setting. 
and these are just modified um, and with some assistance to make it all accessible to the individual. I had music in the background of all of these, but when you take them off Instagram, they don't let you have the music. So uh, it just gives me more, more time to talk at all of you. So that's just to kind of give you a little preview on what is what does it look like? What is this whole fitness thing that we're talking about here? Oops. Okay. So I'm going to pause here for just a second. And um, we're going to get into kind of what these things mean together. But I want to give you a little introduction to what exactly is fit to function. So that's a lot of information up there that you don't necessarily need to read. Um, but the important message is that what we've been doing in the gym is blending functional fitness um, and cognitive communication rehabilitation. And the goal is really just to improve global recovery and functional independence. So we're targeting sort of recovery foundations of neuroplasticity, um, really getting the brain revved up and ready to go, helping you move better, talk better, think better um, in a gym setting. And the goal for our clients is, um, you know, it starts with one-on-one, -on -one, but the goal is to integrate you into a community CrossFit style class because CrossFit is really a place where we build sort of big on community everyone comes in with a shared goal um, and so one of the things that we're working towards is in getting folks into the gym is helping them find a sense of purpose and find a community again because as we know uh, brain injury can be very very isolating so some of the principles that are driving us, you know, um, there's a common belief and misconception out there, um, and a lot of folks know this, I'm sure, and physicians will tell survivors that that greatest recovery um, after a stroke or a brain injury occurs, occurs really within the first year, and then that's all that you get. Um, and we know that that's just not true, um, and recovery really does go on forever. So we operate on the idea that recovery knows no limits, and that survivors deserve an opportunity to kind of find uh, a rehabilitation that is better than just good enough. Um, and you know what folks often wonder like if if we have these opportunities to to do more and be better then why does rehabilitation end why does insurance stop and obviously that's not something that we can combat but what we can do is um, give options for uh, folks to find options beyond that traditional medical model that traditional medical approach of just rehabilitation so we're working in the gym on some of the post rehabilitation needs um, as well as functional recovery and as I mentioned before really working on that isolation and community piece um, so we're going to talk more about this as we go um, but you know in in our setting, we're working with stroke and brain injury survivors, and that has really grown to include folks with a range of neurological um, disabilities or limitations. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of individuals with um, CP uh, and in all kinds of sort of rare diseases that have neural impacts, because I think what we find out there is uh, brain injury is an underserved community, and a lot of folks fit under the umbrella of brain injury. And so the goal is really to reach anyone and everyone that um, can benefit. And if you listen to me long enough, you'll know that I think that everyone can benefit from, from fitness routine. Okay, enough about fit function. Let's get in really quickly, just wanna to touch on disability awareness, and this is a little bit of what drives us. Um, you know, there are 61 million individuals in the United States living with a disability. I think the statistics recently are, it's about one in four um, of Americans living with some type of disability. On, on that, the CDC estimates that 5.3 million individuals are living with a disability from a brain injury. And there are approximately 400 different types of neuromuscular diseases, which for all intents and purposes, right, we're referring to that group as a brain injury population, because these are folks with something neuro that nobody is, um, that, that, that aren't necessarily um, well served. So looking at this, we can see a breakdown related to some of those, of those disability effects on the individual, right? So if you just take mobility and cognition and independent living um, there on the left side of the screen, like this is a large percentage of people out there who um, have challenges potentially just taking care of themselves. Um, and we want to increase functional independence, right? So that is always the goal is to increase functional independence. And these are things that um, we have an opportunity to touch upon uh, in a gym setting. Okay. 
So this is another thing that I've sort of taken directly from CrossFit. So this is not my slide, but it is something that I talk quite a bit about and I want to get into before we move through our fitness um, portion of the lecture. So there's something this referred to as the sickness wellness fitness continuum. So don't worry too, too much about the words up there, but what I want you to sort of take away from this is that when we think about health, um, right? Everyone wants to feel well. We talk about wellness. We want to we want to feel well um, from top to bottom. And when we think about things like eating well, sleeping well, and doing activities that maintain maintain our overall wellness and generally keep us feeling healthy, that's our that's our kind of definition of what is healthy, right? And all of these things are are great, but in reality, wellness is more than just that. So think about your global health um, and wellness in terms of like a savings account. So we want to continually be making deposits into that account. So it grows into kind of a safety net. So if I can get my weight down, um, for example, lower my blood pressure, start to sleep regularly eight hours a night, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and, and eat healthy. I'm starting to slowly fill up my bank account, right? I'm moving the needle um, towards well. But when we think about sickness and then we're moving towards wellness, what is something that truly opposes sickness? And the truth of the matter is that it's fitness, right? Because if I'm healthy and I'm well, but add also that I'm fit and then I'm active, I really loaded that account to help me potentially battle, battle illnesses. Um, you know, the, the leading cause of death in the United States is chronic disease. And a lot of these things we have found that in a gym setting, you can bring down body fat and blood pressure and you can, you know, people start moving better. They start eating better. And there's sort of this circular effect and we can measure all of these things. Um, and if we include fitness, it's really a measure of health in many, many, many ways. Um, okay. Okay. So let's get into fitness training for a moment before we before we dig into um, functional fitness and its application. So any good fitness program has goals, and most should target GPP, which is um, something that we call general physical preparedness. Um, and that is sort of looking at programming and providing workouts that are for general health and longevity. So I'm gonna just flip ahead for a second. So when we talk about GPP, general physical preparedness, it really involves these 10 skills. So everything from your cardiovascular kind of health to stamina, strength, flexibility, power, speed, coordination, agility, balance, and accuracy, okay? So that's your, I'm coming back to this now, that's your everyday gym goer. Um, these are just the things that you do. I wanna go to the gym, I wanna work on this in, in some. So, Maybe now we're going to layer onto that. And if we think about how this is a little more specific, for example, to an adaptive population or somebody with a very specific health need, um, we want to go beyond just that general health and longevity and being fit. And we want to plan for that general physical preparedness, but also, also consider the needs of the athlete, right? So the goal is to improve the athlete's fitness and maybe their functional deficits as well. So you have an area where you need to improve. This could be something um, residual hemiparesis from stroke or an injury um, or, or something along those lines where we're giving you that general fitness, but now we're tagging on what are your needs layer that even further and we're also going to target your specific goals so as a trainer um i want to get you better prepared for everyday health and longevity i want to i want to target anything that is an area of need or a functional deficit for you um, but i also want to know what's important to you and for a lot of folks um so we're going to take into account your own goals which could be weight loss or it could be getting ready for a sport if you're more of an elite athlete but that last point is really where it becomes important, where it's a priority, where the magic really happens, and that is becoming independent. So I want to get you into the gym. I want to get you healthier. I want to target your um, functional deficits, and I want to find greater ways to find you um, functional independence. So we just peeked at this really quickly, but just looking at this again, if we talk about those general physical skills, um, we think about training in isolation, right? So let's think about, for example, a, a PT setting. Um, how many opportunities do we have in structured PT to target all of these things? And, you know, if I, I, this is, I say this out front that this is nothing against physical therapy, but I think it's important, right, that we always remember that life doesn't happen in the clinic. And so when we have survivors and we want them to work on maybe, maybe with PT, they're working on balance and they're working on strength. Um, how often are we giving them the opportunity to work on endurance or agility, 
balance and accuracy, you know, um, taking it a step further. And, and I know, you know, speed, right? We work on walking and we do things like maybe sometimes walking, you know, time control, walking speed tests, but like how often do we get someone where we really get to vary the stimuli and kind of target all of this for general physical preparedness? So these are a lot of words. Again, um, you don't have to over worry about, but I just like to provide sort of this basic information, right? So it's important, I think, when folks think about personal training or CrossFit training or anyone that's designing a program for fitness, that you understand that trainers, we're not just like making you do things just to get sweaty and tired, right? We're actually looking at some things in functional movement patterns that are important to your everyday function. So for example, midline stability, right? Um, those words maybe don't make the most sense depending on your background here. Um, but in a very simple state, the stronger your core is, the better you can protect your spine, right? So that's important for a lot of us in the way that we bend and flex. Um, when we talk about core to extremity movement, um, that's a lot, that's about generating power. Um, and, you know, the, we're strongest when everything is pulled in tight to our body. It's harder to do something with adequate strength when you're reaching out really far away. Um, and so core to extremity is really about um, generating power close to the body and transferring it outwards because we're, we're at our strongest right from the inside. Um, you know, it's like if you think about reaching up and you're on your tiptoes and you're trying to grab something, you're on your tiptoes and you're trying to grab something with your fingertips, that's, um, you're pretty far out, uh, away, far away from your core and you're not at your strongest then. So how can we transfer that power out? Um, we talk about uh, posterior chain engagement, like you know how your mom always says, bend at the knees, don't hurt your back, right? When you pick up a heavy object. So this is really about how do we strengthen those big muscles, um, otherwise known as your posterior chain, to help you kind of move weight around by using the big muscles in the back. Um, and by weight, like picking something up, that could be anything, right? It could be a bag of dog food. It, it could be a dog. Um, it could be a suitcase. And we always, we want to make sure that we're targeting muscle groups that help you have better functional carryover. And then that last one, range of motion, right? We all know from injury, um, especially if you have an, a, an injured limb or something along that, those lines, that um, the strength and integrity of our joints and how far they can move and reach is really important to kind of overall health. So trainers have these things in mind. That's really what that's what I, I show you all of this for, to know that fitness isn't random, at least not um, with the right trainer. So now then if we get into how we move out in the world or in the gym, we have several functional patterns. So we all know what it means to squat. And here you can say, see what joints and muscles are involved. And you know, with a hinge, for example, we're bending at the hip. Um, we bend at the waist, we activate those muscles in our behinds, like I said, and you kind of squeeze everything to pick things up and the hinge is a way that we deadlift, for example. So a lot of charts and tables and a lot of fancy words to mostly say that trainers, particularly functional fitness and adaptive trainers have a plan here. So now let's just go back for a second and talk about CrossFit and this term functional fitness that I keep keep bringing up. So when we're planning for fitness, we're thinking about fitness, we have our everyday movement patterns and what we often see is the GPP, like I talked about, the general physical preparedness, and then some classic patterns, pushing and pressing, pulling, squatting, hinging, and then locomotion. So I put some kind of classic examples on the other side of what what, a, what does this mean? So if you're pushing, what's a what's an exercise version of that? It would be a push up, right? Pull, that's a pull up. That's easy. Um, you know, uh, oops, I have an error there. I'm sorry, but um, you know, a squat would be a squat. A hinge would be a deadlift. Um, and then locomotion is the way that we move, and that could be seated or standing. So I throw a burpee in there because that is one of the ways that we're moving generally up and off the floor. Hopefully this makes even more sense here um, when I talk about, okay, so what is the relevance or what is the functional carryover of any of these exercises? When we think about why am I doing this, it's not just to, uh, you know, to build, to look good in a tank top. Like it's not just because I want to wear a bathing suit this summer. It's I want there to be functional carryover to the strength that I'm building. So a push up, when we talk about function, could be pushing a door closed or pushing a stroller, right? So that's the carry over there. A pull up, so we don't do pull ups in everyday life, but we do pull ourselves around. Sometimes we fall, we reach up, we grab a, hand, a rail and we pull ourselves up. I was recently on a flight and I was thinking about how you have to reach up to pull an overhead compartment closed when you wanna put your luggage away. Um, so those are really classic examples of just how we need pulling that pulling motion in our everyday existence. 
when it comes to deadlifting, that is really just picking up an object, right? And that can be pretty heavy to pretty light, but it still matters how we approach that. So picking up bags of groceries or maybe picking up your grandkids, or like I said before, picking up your dog, which I have a 25 pound dog who I pick up, but I also have a 65 pound dog who likes to be picked up uh, as much as the other one. So you need, you need to be able to move through a deadlift pattern in order to do that. And what's a squat? It's sitting down on the couch, sitting down on the toilet, it's getting off the toilet. You know, a lot of times folks come into the gym and I say, when's the last time you, you, you did any squatting? And people are like, oh, never. And you're like, well, actually you did today when you sat in the car, or when you got up off the toilet. So there's a real functional carryover to that. And then burpees, you know, everybody has a love-hate relationship um, with burpees, but a burpee is simply getting up off the ground. And that is something that we have to do right it happens we fall um, we find ourselves in these kind of positions that we need to be able to get out of so that's the functional aspect of the movement and in crossfit everything we do is based on these functional movement patterns so um see for yourself um i love this video i cannot take credit for it but a, a wonderful pt who has a crossfit style um, training center sent this to me <laughs> <laughs> so I love this video so much that I can make you watch it again. Um, you know, so again, here's that functional carryover. So a deadlift is just picking things up. A farmer's carry is carrying things, lunges, mimic, kind of getting up, um, going up and down stairs. Um, sorry, it's a skipping around on my end a little bit. Um, and you know, some of the barbell movements that we do are talking about transference of power. You're using your hips to kind of propel something up to a certain, sorry, come on slides. So you're using your hips to kind of drive something, get it up off the ground, up to a height where you can then push it up, right? And so sometimes we're like, why am I using a barbell? And it's like, well, this is why. And then this is, I love this version of a burpee. You gotta get down, you gotta get something, you gotta get back up again. Um, and they must have known when they sent this to me how much I love dogs because um, obviously you need to squat down and, and give your dog a treat. So a lot of functional carry over here. So, you know, I talk about the deadlift a lot um, and simply put, we all have to pick things up sometimes. So I just include this video here because I want you to take a look at what, you know, what is deadlifting? Sometimes it's throwing a lot of plates on a bar. You know, if you think about a Globo gym, you think about big guys lifting, you know, deadlifting three, four, 500 pounds. Um, but take a look at what deadlifting um, adapted for a range of limitations and in individuals looks like. So that's Cheryl, she's a 56 year old uh, right-sided stroke survivor. Um, and that is Mike, and he's also 56 actually, left-sided stroke survivor. And the plates on the floor to accommodate for range of motion. Sometimes people, because of um, either they're using single, single arm or because of uh, tight hamstrings or something that can't quite get all the way to the floor. So we use the plates to kind of just elevate and make it a little more comfortable. Um, Mike was really proud of himself. He said, please take a picture, send it to my daughter. Uh, Maeve is a um, complex chemo uh, brain sort of oncology survivor. Um, so she's dealt with a lot. And this is Marina, who I'll talk about a little bit later. She had an AVM rupture and even she likes deadlifting. And then there's my buddy, Joey, who you'll see a bit of who's lifting from a seated position. He always makes me end the videos with him doing really heavy lifts, which he's pretty proud of. I mean, he can deadlift more than me, so he should be. Uh, okay. All right, so let's get into adaptive training. Now, <clears throat> when we think about um, make adaptive training, the goal is to make fitness accessible and inclusive. And how do we do that? And that's by minimizing limitations. So. In the gym setting in particular, we talk about um, limitations or something caused by a disability. Um, and in the gym, my role as an adaptive trainer is to minimize any limitation to help provide access to fitness. 
So from a physical perspective, um, if you are someone who is seated, you need to be in a wheelchair, you're limited in because of your injury so that you can't do things like squat. Um, but I'm going to provide access to fitness. If you, Depending on what kind of function you do have, um, we will get your legs involved in a way that makes sense. And if not, we'll create a different adaptation. So oftentimes on squat day, our athletes that are seated will do um, dips of some sort because that's kind of how they move and transfer around. That's how they get up and out of their chair and move over. Um, so I'm trying, my goal is to provide fit a fitness opportunity um, that kind of minimizes any limitation that you have. It could be that you only have an upper extremity impairment, you've only got one, one good arm to use, so we're gonna plan appropriately for that. Um, for lower extremity, same, you've only got one functional leg or one that's you're more steady on, and so we're gonna find ways to accommodate to minimize the limitation so you can access the fitness. And, you know, if you take that a step further, um, folks have cognitive limitations, right? And so very similarly, as an adaptive trainer, it is my job to make the fitness accessible to you. And maybe that's me helping you remember. Um, maybe it's making the language simple to, to help you uh, understand kind of complex tasks. Maybe it's something related to attention. We're gonna get into this a little bit more. Um, but you know, overall we're adapting and modifying the workout to fit the profile of needs. Um, the goal is always to make the fitness accessible. So uh, a simple example, right, of a cardiovascular type exercise that also has some coordination, uh, balance and agility, but um, jump rope, right? That's something we all did as kids. We all know how to jump rope. Some of us are probably better than others. Um, but what if you can't jump? And that could be for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so here you see these ropes, these are jump ropes, they're called split ropes or multi ropes, and they're provided for seated athletes. I'm gonna play that again just so you can see it. I know it's quick. Um, and so Joey's in his scooter chair and his buddy Larry, who came to do um, what we call an, sort of an empathy workout with him, he wanted to get the full experience, sat and did the workout with him. So he's still getting that stimulus. This is, we've made this movement now accessible for him. Now, if you apply that to some, you know, neuro or someone with sort of a hemiparesis who can't jump and maybe we're worried about, or if they can, we're worried about their balance, well, guess what? We can sit and we can swing on one side. Um, so this is Cheryl getting that same stimulus and she, I don't know how you can tell she's got a big smile. She really likes the jump ropes for some reason. Um, but these are really fun and they're actually really hard. Um, I And they're a good modification for just for an injury. Um, so I often have athletes using these. So you have layered opportunities here to, to provide access to fitness. So this is my friend Joey again, um, and talking about minimizing limitations. So Joey has a neuromuscular disease. He has a rare condition called Friedrich's ataxia. Um, and so Joey, um, as far as modifications go, sort of fits into your standard seated athlete, though he does have hip function and some, some uh, involvement of his legs, but he has the ability to sling a barbell over his head. But because of the severity of the ataxia that comes with his disease process, um, Without some hands-on assistance, there's a possibility that he'll hit himself in the face with a barbell or he'll just overshoot or shoot off to the side. And it's not super safe um, for his body but for, to move that way. And so I am providing access to fitness by being the stabilizing hands. And to be clear, I'm not lifting that barbell at all. That weight is all on him, but I'm holding on to it in the event the, the ataxia kind of gets the best of him or the movement pattern just isn't safe. And I want to make sure that he's not going to kind of either hit himself or fall out of his chair. So again, minimizing that limitation so that he can really get after it with fitness. And this is kind of what it looks like in action. Again, I'm minimizing any limitations, making sure he can access. I'm giving him the barbell. I've got my hands on for steady assistance. And you can even see he kind of move wobble side to side sometimes. He doesn't always get the straight pattern. Those of you who have experience with ataxia too probably know that um, often that's the first one or two are a little harder. Um, and then you kind of get into set and that's been his experience. But so again, like as the trainer, I'm gonna move the barbell and then I'm gonna get the ropes into his hands. And I'm really just, you know, kind of helping out with the transitions while he's doing all the work. And I'm just kind of there to make, to really ensure that his limitations don't prevent him from getting a good workout. Um, and, you know, 
cognitively, I, as far as assistance goes, because he's really concentrating on what he's doing, I'm counting his reps. So um, anyone who's judged, you'll see me nodding my head. Anyone who's done any judging or counting reps for anyone else in a CrossFit gym knows that if you don't bob your head uh, when you count jump rope, you basically can't do it. So um, if you know, you know. But at any rate, so that's Joey working through that. Okay, so we've been talking a bit about adapting fitness um, and how we minimize limitation physically. Let's talk a bit about how we do that from a cognitive linguistic perspective. Um, so, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, there are all different kinds of um, uh, challenges and limitations when you've had a brain injury, and it can affect all different aspects of cognition or language. And so what we do in the gym isn't unlike any other setting. So when it comes to language, um, for auditory comprehension, we're gonna provide simple instructions. We're gonna break down multi-unit commands. We're gonna give the individual uh, extra time to respond, uh, maybe provide some choices to aid their verbal output. Whatever they need to support their language, that can be done through a trainer in a in, in the right in a one-on-one -on -one setting or even in a group setting. When it comes to memory, um, you know, anyone who does uh, CrossFit in particular, I can't speak to other brands of fitness because I've been doing CrossFit so long that I'm totally indoctrinated. But um, when you're in the middle of a workout and it's really hard and it's really varied, it's very hard to remember what's happening. We call that sort of uh, wad brain workout of the day brain where you're just like it's so high intensity that you can't really think through what's coming next. So we can help with memory with folks. We can give them written cues. We can write the workout on a personalized whiteboard. We could even add in some steps for sequencing. We do a lot of cueing, you know, first do this, then do that, help people kind of remember. So I'm making sure that your ability to remember the fit, the, the workout isn't going to get in the way of your ability to actually access the fitness and do the work. We can help, um, like I mentioned with sequencing, um, we can use visual picture boards or schedules, which can help with language and memory and organization. Um, you know, the working memory piece comes in a lot um, where, it can be, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped attention, I'll come back to that. But with working memory, it can be hard to count your reps or track your rounds or know what you're doing in the moment and what comes next and kind of pay attention to all of that because there can even be some mental math involved, mental manipulation. So we can help modify, you know, like with Joey, I was counting his reps. Often for my clients, in, especially in the beginning, I'm counting their reps and I'm telling them exactly what to do next and then hopefully handing over that burden of responsibility. As far as attention, right, there's so many ways to simplify this and limit external factors. The gym is a really noisy place. There's a lot of music on. There can be a lot of people around. So for a lot of the clients, that just means we take them to a more quiet space and maybe we don't play music or if we do, it's not so loud. Um, but, you know, it can be a distracting environment and there's nothing as professionals that we really can't do to help kind of minimize that. And then when it comes to problem solving, reasoning, planning, and organization, we always, you know, there's a lot of discussion in certain CrossFit style workouts about strategy and where are you going to break it up or when are you going to max out your reps and, and how do you figure out the best way to approach a complicated workout to maximize your fitness potential. Um, and we can help with that. Um, we don't have to, we can take all of the cognitive load of that for an individual. So here's what some of that might look like, right? From simple things that a trainer could create in the moment to those that might require more preparation. You, you know, you probably see things just like this in, in various rehab settings or tools that either you use at home or you've used with um, patients or clients or yourself. You know, we, we write things down. We all write things down to remember. I don't do a workout personally without writing it down myself because I know I'll forget in the middle. Um, but we can give athletes written reminders. We can give them checklists to kind of move through things. We can give them a visual picture board. Um, and that's a, a picture in the corner there of some poker chips because it's not only is it visual, but it's also tactile. You know, you can move through your rounds and kind of move one to the side and you know how many you've done. So a lot of opportunities, a lot of different tools that we can use to make this better or more accessible. And then on the more heavily modified type of fitness, we can be really hands-on with individuals. So um, this is Marina, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, Marina uh, suffered a, a large AVM rupture um, at the age of 10. And at the time that I met her, she um, was kind of just out of rehab and um, wasn't using her dominant hand very much and walked with support and wasn't um, hadn't wasn't speaking yet and she wasn't voicing yet either um, and so um, let me show you the video first and then I'll talk over it a little bit so 
you know, again, this is heavily modified, right? I'm giving her full body support, but it's helping her get through through the workouts. She also really likes to look at herself. So the uh, flipped around camera is good for visual modeling, but also for motivation. I find with all of the kids that I work with, if they can see themselves, while it can be a little distracting, it's also a little exciting. With the rower, you know, she's this was the first time we really saw her get both arms involved. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, she, we use functional fitness to really improve that the way that she was moving. And the cool thing about when I talk about embedding speech and language goals is that um, she it wasn't yet at a point where she was able to coordinate voicing and speaking, but she was starting to articulate a bit and you could sort of see her shaping the sounds um, of numbers when she would count reps. And one of her favorite things became telling me what to do. So she got to point and tell me if she wanted to do, she wanted me to do push-ups or pull-ups or whatever it was. And then, but then she had to count them with me. And at first, while she wasn't voicing, she was sort of, we could see the beginning of the, the articulators moving to shape those, shape those words. And even more so, um, we started getting some grunting, got some voicing happening because who doesn't grunt when they lift heavy objects? And so there's this really good functional carryover in the gym setting for someone like her. Okay. We're getting there, guys. You're doing great. Hang in there with me. So we talked a bit about um, approaches to minimize limitations, and now we'll flip that into how we can treat cognition and language in the gym. This is where sort of the modifying then becomes the opportunity for improvement. And I like to, I talk a lot about the zone of proximal development, right? Like when you come in, the burden of responsibility is on me to really help you through things. And over time, I'm going to start to meet you where you're at and give that responsibility back to you. So the gym is a really great place to work on so many of these skills. It's rife with opportunity. Um, so a few of the many ways that we can provide treatment rather than just modifying when it comes to language, what we do is we start to build in some structured naming, right? There's all kinds of uh, new objects, implements in the gym, the tools that you're using, the barbell, the kettlebell, the, the rig, the wall ball. And this is a good place to practice word finding, to practice naming. We also do generative naming and describing, and there's that opportunity to build on um, the complexity of your comprehension where you're increasing the ability to follow multi-step commands. When it comes to memory, like I mentioned, similar to, to naming and language, it's remembering sort of the items or the movements or the things that you did in the gym. Maybe it's remembering the names of other athletes or coaches. Um, it's a really good opportunity to talk about what you did last time or what you what what we're going to do next time or upcoming tasks and building in some of that perspective recall. It also gives athletes, um, individuals and survivors something to talk about with their families. We often do sort of a memory. It's not a memory book. It's really a fitness journal, which um, most CrossFitters have some version of anyway, because they always want to know how well they've done a certain workout or how much weight they've lifted. So we sort of have taken it's an opportunity to kind of say this is the workout you did and then it's something that people can go home and um, talk about later and then work on remembering for discussion for next time when it comes to attention we can start to reintroduce some of that competing stimuli um, there are workouts in CrossFit in particular where the clock will beep at you every minute and every minute you might be in the middle of something like a simple example you have to do 100 kettlebell swings for time every minute on the minute the clock is going to beep and when it beeps I want you to stop and do five air squats, for example. Um, so this is a little more uh, cognitively complex and challenging, but it's a good opportunity to um, really build on that and start to work on you know, your alternating and divided attention across these, this range of stimuli. Um, Let's see. And, you know, as far as we talked a little bit about problem solving and reasoning, like starting to give people the opportunity to plan through workouts to make decisions on on weights or rep schemes or things like that. Um, organize organizing even just a room. Where are going to where am I going to put my gear? What are, where do I want my water bottle? How, do I want to make sure that I can see the clock? Things like that that um, are a little more um, a little higher level in terms of planning. And then there are way, a lot of ways, and this is one of my favorite things, to really treat that functional cognitive independence in the gym. Um, it, with a lot of clients, the goal is that it seems simple, but we all know that it's not to start to schedule their own sessions, to pay for their own sessions, to get to and from, whether it's taking public transportation or, or an Uber, and we see a lot of growth in those areas. So there's just a lot of ways to start, start to build, again, handing over that burden of responsibility.
<clears throat> so I've gotten giving you a little insight into what we do in the gym, um, how we treat language, and here's a bit of it together. This is what it looks like. This is done remotely. There's not a lot of fitness in here, but um, both Christian and I are in the gym and we're doing sets of, um, we're basically doing language tasks in between rounds of fitness. Um, it's a really great uh, picture that I've saved of myself there, but I'll get it moving in a second. Um, so I just want to give you a little background on Christian. So Christian is a 40 year old stroke survivor and he lives in Germany and he speaks two language, languages. So he speaks German and English. And at the time that they came to me, he had recovered um, a decent amount of his verbal output capabilities in German, but wasn't able to communicate in English. Um, now his wife uh, was primarily an English speaker and didn't really speak German. So it was quite the challenge. And he was really motivated to kind of find an opportunity to work more on his English output. And in addition to all of that, Christian was a CrossFitter and he was a CrossFit coach. Um, and his coach was really supportive um, in trying to find ways to get him um, back to coaching uh, among every other things. So this is kind of what that looks like. Open the door. Brush your teeth. Eat your at lunch, and it was that's a good you answer. Did read the books develop oh. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Furniture that you sleep on. Bed. Something that supports your head when you sleep. Hello. Pillow. Vehicle that you drive. Car. Eight. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, uh, like I said, it's a pretty short one. And if you've had any experience, direct experience with speech therapy, you know that that's a lot of what our structured tests can look like, especially early on. But um, at the time that I met Christian, he, he had only a handful of English words um, and was very easily frustrated and he could not count to 10. And so um, for him, we would do uh, a lot a lot of the format. And this is what we see a lot in the gym that works best is you do sort of a round of fitness and then one to two minutes of language drilling, and then another, another round of the fitness, and then a little more drilling. Um, and we do some pre and post kind of assessments, measuring both fitness and language, um, and drilling for the things from a language or communication perspective that were most salient. Um, you know, so for some individuals, uh, we use the workout to fuel the output a little bit, because frankly, it takes the edge off for a lot of people, um, especially if you're a little hesitant in your language output and a little maybe embarrassed, um, get your adrenaline pumping a little bit, and, and uh, some of the walls come down. So that's been really helpful. Um, but at any rate, so that's Christian. Open the. Okay. So I showed you that. What does it look like a little bit more structured in the gym? So you saw some um, videos and pictures of Mike before, and I'm just going to go over that. So Mike is a 56 year old um, left MCA stroke survivor. Um, he's got residual right hemiparesis, wears a right ankle orthosis, and he's plegic in his right upper extremity. He ambulates with a cane and, still, and was using at the time he met handrail as, um, assistance for stairs and things like that. He has uh, some lingering mild non-fluent aphasia. Um, Mike was a, um, a former car salesman and he really wanted to get back to work, um, but never felt like his language was good enough, even though you know he's very conversationally able to, to do quite well for himself. But, you know, his goal from a cognitive linguistic perspective was that um, he wanted to work on those more complex discussions. So we would do a round of a workout or a round or a set of things. And then we'd simulate a discussion about car sales with him selling me different cars and the structured Q&A. And it gave him sort of the, the opportunity to dig in a little bit uh, more deeply as far as his language was concerned. So. I put this up there to sort of show you what a sample workout. So AMRAP, if you're not familiar, is the crossfit -y kind of thing. It's as many rounds as possible, and then the number is the duration, so in 10 minutes. So a uh, kind of standard kind of workout you might see for your everyday athlete would be as many rounds as possible in 10 minutes of three burpees, five air squats, seven pull-ups, and nine deadlifts. So you get to that ninth deadlift, you go right back to three burpees, and you start over, and you see how far you can get. Now, modified for, um, for, for Mike's needs, we took a, a sort of a modified approach to burpees and did kind of a, a half lunge, half Turkish get up, kind of get down to the floor on one arm and then back up again. We had him squatting to a target. So he was sitting on a 24 inch box. So he was getting that squat activation, but with a little increased safety. He was using single arm ring rows. So just pulling with the one good arm and then doing kettlebell deadlifts with again, with just on the one side. From a cognitive perspective, um, you know, previewing and reviewing the, remember the names of 
things and what was coming next, some cueing to get from movement to movement and assistance with counting his rounds. So outcomes for Mike, you know, um, after 12 sessions, we retested that same fitness. And on the first time through, he was able to achieve four rounds and four reps in 10 minutes. And on the next, on that, after 12 sessions, he did five rounds plus eight reps. And that was, I should add, at a heavier load. So he did a heavier deadlift. So not only was he faster, but he did so under sort of the increased intensity and load. Um, and, you know, so he'd been building strength all along, which is awesome. As far as language, he increased his um, structured naming from 40% accuracy to 90 um, and had increased measures of fluency in a structured conversational, uh, structured conversational test, excuse me. As far as functional independence, Mike was able to start ambulating more often without his cane indoors, going up and down stairs without holding on as much. Um, and in terms of just range of motion and his uh, squat stability, he was able to start squatting to a 20 inch box instead of just that 24 inch box. So that's a pretty significant difference. If you're not familiar, I would say 20 inches is about um, your standard seat or couch height. Um, and he started to become much more independent with getting to and from the gym, scheduling, paying, all of those things. And while this wasn't part of this particular workout, um, one of Mike's goals when I met him was to improve his ability to do stairs. He moved up to Boston from uh, somewhere in the South to live with his daughter. And she lived in a, a very old uh, classic downtown Boston um, multi-unit walk up and with very narrow stairs. And it was uh, very hard for him to kind of manage going up and down those stairs without really needing to hold on quite heftily. Um, and uh, at the time I met Mike, it had been uh, 11 years since he'd walked upstairs without holding on. And so this was something we, we practiced. And I love, I just like love watching his face in this video. A little unsure, can I do it? Oh, yep, yep, I think I can. Did such a good job, I'll try that side again. And then he celebrates, and that's the best part. Um, so really finding opportunities to help people build greater functional independence, that's like really, really uh, what this is all about and what the we have opportunities for in the gym. Okay. We're getting there, almost done here. So to review, uh, what we're doing is we're modifying workouts, right? And adapting as needed from all perspectives. And that can be um, the general fitness modifications physically and as well as cognitive modifications um, and providing some functional treatment within that context. So those modifications can include, you know, physically seated single arm, using a target, elevated lifting from the floor, things of that nature. From a cognitive perspective, we're structuring and assisting with language, reducing stimuli, helping with counting, planning, remembering, and all of that. And then we start off by modifying, and with both the fitness and the cognitive aspect, we then start to scale up. So we're going to increase the weights. We're going to make the duration of the cardio longer. We're going to lower that box. We're going to get you closer to the floor when you're lifting. You know, it's important... Uh, to understand that CrossFit is what we call infinitely scalable. Um, and that means that we can modify the intensity for almost any population, including, um, you know, those with neuromuscular diseases who maybe fatigue is a big part of the process. And even those recovering from brain injury where fatigue is a real issue. Sometimes workouts have a really um, specific balance of work rest um, to make sure that you can kind of target um, that high intensity and find ways to recover um, and always trying to, you know, there's always a good balance of strength, coordination, endurance, as well as the rest where it's needed. And we're going to scale up the fitness. We're also going to scale up the cognition, right? We're going to increase that carryover. Um, we're going to prime and discuss and, and push on that ability to continue to discuss fitness outside of the gym. Um, things like memory books, handing over the responsibility kind of, of getting to and from and doing it, the work on your own. Um, and then lastly, you know, we're really working to improve functional independence, handing over that responsibility for all kinds of activities. Um, I wanted to include this. These are some, I, I talked about Mike's functional outcomes, but these are some of the global improvements that we've um, 
seen with clients of all types. So as I keep talking about, I love to talk about functional independence. Um, I love to see that almost every client of mine now comes and pays for their own sessions, gets to and from its schedules. Some people need uh, more frequent reminders than others to make sure that they get there on time and all of that. Um, but improvements in the ability to kind of plan, schedule, initiate. Um, and, and I like to think that some of the initiation is cognitive recovery, but I think also some of it is motivation because we're helping people um, who maybe otherwise don't leave the house a whole lot um, have something that they want to be doing. We're seeing uh, improvements in new learning, um, working memory on average increasing from one to two units of recall on structured tasks, which with working memory is pretty significant. Um, verbal fluency, um, I do a lot of the FAS tests where you just give people a letter, ask them to name as many um, objects as they can, items that start with that. And um, we're seeing an average increase of five to eight words in verbal fluency measures after, I, I do a lot of the pre and post with about 10 to 12 sessions, depending on the frequency with which individuals come, because that varies a lot. Um, improvements in naming, repeating, and command following, a lot of good concrete carryover. One of my favorite stories was that I'd been working with uh, someone who's another young uh, AVM survivor, young, he was in his, in his 40s, not young like Marina, young like me, um, and he, uh, I got a text from his wife that said, oh my god, he just helped carry in the groceries and put them away. And that's the kind of functional carryover that is super important because not only did he have the confidence in his balance and his strength to pick something up and carry it in with his hemipresis and put it all away, but it was also just kind of showed more initiation and greater engagement and kind of just family life. You know, I think a lot of survivors, um, it can be hard to kind of reintegrate yourself, especially when you're coming through recovery and, and a lot of things are done for you. But that was a really powerful moment. Um, and, and with that, you know, like I was saying, caregiver reports um, sort of improve confidence, greater functional independence, communication, and, and more involvement in family, like I said. And now a little bit of science, and we're very close here. So I touched on neuroplasticity, right? And we know everything we do is governed by how our neurons connect to one another or how our brain cells communicate. And there's a lot of research out there about fitness and mental health. There's a huge body related to that. And we know that when we work out, neurotransmitters are firing in all kinds of positive ways, right? Our senses are heightened, our mood and focus are improved, we're motivated, we're invigorated. And in addition to priming our state of mind, um, exercise directly influences learning at the cellular level and it improves the brain's potential for new learning. Studies have shown that exercise increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, and this is a key molecule involved in plastic changes related to learning and memory. And what, we're, what this, a lot of these studies have shown is that there's a, an increase in this specifically in the hippocampus, which we know um, is responsible for new learning. There are obviously other elements that in, input new learning, but this is a, a key factor. Um, so, you know, through fitness, we're essentially priming the brain to learn. As I mentioned before, there's a growing body of evidence about exercise and learning. I offer you a few highlights here because, frankly, it would be an entire 90-minute uh, presentation all on its own to dig into the research. But there are a lot of studies out there. Um, I would direct you back to Kotman's 1995, excuse me, 1995 study of exercise and BDNF in mice, in which rodents who exercise had a significant increase in BDNF in the hippocampus specifically. And not only that, but the further they ran, the higher their BDNF levels. So what we know about BDNF is it's a protein responsible for learning. Um, a 2000 study out there found that um, individuals learn vocabulary words 20% faster following exercise, um, and that the, the rate of learning uh, also correlates with BDNF levels. Another study that same year showed that cognitive flexibility improves after just one 35 minute treadmill session, which is crazy, right? So you can actually increase so much with just a little hit of fitness. I always tell people I do my best work right after my workout in the morning. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that, that um, when you get those neurotransmitters firing a lot of, there's a lot more potential. So I've already kind of said this, but research, research supports that exercise improves learning basically on three levels. So first it optimizes arousal, attention, and motivation. It prepares and encourages our nerve cells to bind to one another, which thus prepares us to for some new learning at the cellular level. Um, and it increases development of new nerve cells from stem cells, specifically in the hippocampus. 
So in summary, um, what are we doing here, right? We're targeting neuro neuroplasticity and new learning. Um, and we're doing that in a functional setting in the gym where we're also improving fitness and thereby wellness. What this has brought for brain injury survivors is a sense of belonging, a way to engage in the community, and, and a little bit of a sense of purpose, a reason to get up and out the door. Um, and I think what's most important is the, the increase that we're seeing in functional independence and all of the opportunities that we have for that. Um, and you know, our motto at Pitta Function is better than good enough. And we're seeing that folks are achieving a, a recovery that is just that, that it's better than good enough, that it's more than just rehab's over, okay, good luck. Um, we're finding ways to kind of help folks do more. And so uh, I'm gonna sort of close with this video that a dear friend of mine put together um, for me in the gym, just so you can see and hear a little bit more about uh, what we do in action. I'm Jenna Muri Rosenthal, founder of Fit to Function Recovery. I'm a speech pathologist and a brain injury specialist, and I've worked in rehab for over a dozen years. I talk about Fit to Function, and I say that folks think about in life that they can get to a place of good enough. What I want for them is to be better than good enough, and I think there's a lot of opportunity here for that. But working with Sydney has been an exceptional experience. She has cerebral palsy. She has been able to kind of overcome a lot in her life to get to this point where she's seeking to be an elite athlete in the adaptive world. Jenna's just put a whole lot more meaning into my training. Like I go to the gym and I can't help but grin from like ear to ear just because I can't wait to tell her how it went. She has trouble with balance. She has trouble with transitions. And so we find ways to optimize what her brain is best at to help her you know, push through and gain strength and gain movements that she didn't think she would ever be able to do because of her disability. We're finding ways to fight for that. Nobody likes to go to the gym and do the things that they're good at, but I quickly found out I actually fell in love with becoming strong. It's a gift to really be able to be a part of helping people make improvements kind of across the board and see them doing things that they never thought that they could do. See them picking up a heavy object or moving their body around or picking themselves up, getting up and off the floor, as simple as that is. There are people who never thought that that was possible. You know, Joey has a degenerative disease. He has something that is inherited. But what we found by getting him in the gym is he's gaining in places that he should have never been able to gain. He's gaining muscle mass. He's gaining core stability. He's able to move himself around better on and off the floor, in and out of his chair. His doctors have even shown that he's had some reverse in some of his medical conditions, like his heart condition, as a result of just getting fit and finding functional ways to move through space. She deserves all the praise she gets. She has a warm heart and she truly wants the best for each client she has. One of the unique things about Fit to Function 2 is that it has brought together a community. Sydney came in to do this virtual composition, sort of unknown to everyone else in the Fit to Function community, and they all came up from as far as virtually in Germany. Uh, Joey was here, all of the clients checking in, uh, and it's created a space for these people to meet anywhere. You know, without even meeting me in person, she arranged for all these people to come cheer me on, and like my heart has just been so full. Clients want to continue to put in the work that goes beyond just what traditional medicine and rehabilitation will give them, and it's been the most rewarding experience of my life. Fitness is for everybody and everything. Jenna, you're so I leave you uh, with Mike because no one shines in the gym quite like he does. And uh, it's really great to just see that smile and, he, you know, learning, improving and, and, and changing his, both his brain and his body. So I always like to end on, on those photos. Um, and, you know, I'd love to open up for some questions and here's all of my contact information. Um, please uh, reach out, ask questions. Um, you know, I use my Instagram the most because I think this is a population of individuals that needs to see themselves in the gym to really believe that it's a place for them. And I do believe that it is for everybody. Um, so, yeah, that's it for me. I'd love to take some questions. Excellent.